Okay, well, let's get started. It's great to see all of you here tonight. Thanks for joining us um, for tonight's presentation, is, which is Exploring the National Monuments in Colorado and Beyond. I'm Sarah Gorecki, Sarah Gorecki and I'm the Director of Publishing at the Colorado Mountain Club. This evening, we have CMC Press author Mike Andres, who will show photos from some of the 70 national monuments in his new book, Guide to Western National Monuments. These are the best places to visit if you want to hike and camp in spectacular scenery with relatively few people compared to national parks. Mike's book covers 11 Western states, including Colorado, Arizona, California, Idaho, Montana, New Mexico, Nevada, Oregon, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming. So Guide to Western National Monuments will be 20% off during tonight's presentation on our website cmcpress.org. And we're doing a special, present, a special um, membership promotion tonight. Anyone who buys a copy of the book during tonight's event at cmcpress.org will be entered into a drawing to win a free gift membership to Colorado Mountain Club. Um, we'll announce the winner at the end and you can use the membership for yourself or give it to a friend. And for those of you who are not yet Colorado Mountain Club members, our next new member orientation will be August 17th. And I'll put all this information in the chat. Um, so Zoom etiquette, I'm sure you are all quite familiar with Zoom by now. However, here are a few friendly reminders. Um, first, please keep your micro microphones muted. Second, please keep your cameras off. It really helps with um, internet bandwidth for the presentation. Just as a reminder, this session is being recorded and please ask all of your questions in the chat. We will try to stop and interrupt. I'll, I'll interrupt Mike. Um, if you have a question on a particular slide, go ahead and put it in and I'll ask it. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A to cover any other questions at the end. Okay. Um, so to introduce our speaker tonight, Mike has traveled a good part of the world in search of adventure and photography. To write his book, he visited 69 of the 70 national monuments. There was just one he could not get into, um, Devil's Post Pile, due to avalanche danger at the time, but I think he tried to visit it twice, but Mike will fill us in more about that. Um, and he enjoyed visiting and photographing each, and photographing each one. Um, with that, over to you, Mike. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate the introduction. Um, so my name is Mike Andrews. I've been a CMC member for a couple of decades. Um, what we're going to do here this evening is try to showcase some of the monuments within the book. It's um, impossible to cover all 70 of them in one presentation, <clears throat> but we'll do about 46 out of the 70, and we'll have an emphasis on Colorado monuments since most of the audience is from Colorado. Kind of gives you an idea of some of the things you can do here in our own state. Of the monuments covered in uh, the presentation, the smallest is Yucca House down in southwestern Colorado at a mere 34 acres. The largest in California is Mojave Trails with 1.6 million acres. The total acreage of the monuments we'll cover in this presentation is over 8.7 million acres. And for me, that's, that's incredible. I mean, this, these are all public lands. These are our lands, the American lands. They're open for the most part to public recreation, a variety of activities. Um, many of them have dispersed camping options for you. It's, it's just a wonderful thing that our country has in terms of uh, how they protect public lands for public use. You don't find that in many other countries around the world. So we'll get started. The first slide here is a bit of a teaser. It's kind of on a lot of people's bucket lists, the wave over in uh, Vermilion Cliffs, but we'll get to that a little more later. So what allows these monuments to be created so easily is the Antiquities Act of 1906. Any sitting president has the authority to proclaim a national monument. And the point behind that is that it's to protect significant natural, cultural, and or scientific features 
on existing federal lands. They don't create new federal lands. It's typically lands that had belonged to the BLM or the Forest Service or even the National Park Service previously, or even state lands at times. And they've simply given them a higher level of protection. When this act was passed, there was a lot of problems with uh, pilfering at a lot of these cultural sites, artifacts and fossils and whatnot would be removed and then sold to museums or whatever. And so what should have been preserved for the American public was being lost and distributed around the world, literally. So this is a very important piece of legislation that gives the president a wide authority to create these national monuments. Only two presidents have chosen not to use this authority. And I'm guessing you could probably guess or suspect who those are. And that would be uh, Presidents Nixon and Trump. Neither created or expanded on existing natural monument, national monuments. So everyone else has, and that's a good thing. I think that's one of those bipartisan things that everybody's in general agreement with. They don't make any more new land. What we got is what we got. And if you don't work to protect what we have, well, then generations down the road, they'll have even less. So President Theodore Roosevelt was the first president to proclaim a national monument. And that happened to be Devil's Tower up in Northeastern Wyoming. So this is the vehicle I use for uh, pretty much all of the travels to these different monuments. It's a stock three quarter ton Dodge truck with a pop-up camper. Um, the only thing we altered on it were you know, slightly oversized tires. And that, that's a good thing. It carried a lot of weight. And a lot of the roads into these monuments are horribly, horribly rough, very poorly maintained. It's simply just not a priority for the agency that manages a given monument. So uh, kind of keep that in mind, you know, a lot of SUVs and they have all wheel drive and for the most part that works well, but there are gonna be instances when a proper four wheel drive is what you really need. And several of these monuments are extremely remote. I mean, you might drive 50 miles get down into the monument itself. And that's on a bad road that just gets worse the further you go in. So we think about a tow charge. You're talking $1,000, $2,000. So better to be prepared ahead of time and avoid that or exercise good judgment knowing when to turn around and save yourself some money. <laughs> so a little bit of my own personal history. Um, I spent 37 years in the Army. I retired in 2009 and I brought a few issues with me from the military into retirement. Among those is PTSD. And what I found with this project, it began as a, a self-assigned photography project. And what it did was it gave me a, a bit of a purpose and a focus and an end goal in sight, particularly once I was able to find a publisher through the CMC Press. So I'm not saying this works for everybody. I'm just sharing that, hey, for me, it was very valuable in and of itself, even without the publication piece. It was just an added benefit. So sometimes small things can make a big difference in one's life. And maybe just visiting all these monuments, making it a life goal to go see each and every one of them will, will serve a similar purpose for yourself. So the black dots on the map here represent the monuments we're going to visit uh, in this presentation. There's what we would be saying, there's 46 out of the 70 total. It's kind of a shotgun blast on the map as to there's no easy way to go from one to the next to the next. So. We'll do the best we, we can. We'll start in Southern uh, New Mexico, go North from there and then kind of do a counterclockwise loop and finish up down in uh, Arizona. So here we go. The first one is right outside the Las Cruces, New Mexico. It's the Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks, a, a rather large monument, offers a lot of different uh, activities 
hiking. There's a trail of 27, 28 miles open to horses. It goes from here to the Franklin Mountains in Texas. Uh, some rock climbing in two of the units and uh, remote camping, dispersed camping if you wish. There's a visitor center on the east side. We're looking, I'm sorry, on the west side. We're looking to the east in this slide here, the Oregon Mountains themselves. Uh, the four units are Oregon Mountains, Desert Peaks, Potrillo Mountains, and the Dona Ana Mountains. And they all kind of surround Las Cruces. Rio Grande del Norte is in the upper portion of New Mexico, right along the Colorado border. It's a large monument, a lot of space, a lot of different activities you can do there. This is a good example of how a river cuts a chasm through the underlying rock and soil as compared to a glacier. A river cuts more of a V shape and the glacier is going to cut more of a U shaped valley. So you can kind of get a sense of the origins of, of a particular drainage. This is in the northern part of the monument, uh, about 10 miles south of the Colorado border. It's a big place, lots of room. The large non-snow covered peak to the right is a Ute Mountain, just over 10,000 feet. The peaks in the distance are the Southern Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And we're just dispersed camping. We followed a track down, found a place that was suitable and set up our camp. Now into Colorado, this is fluorescent fossil beds. They're uh, probably an hour or so west of Colorado Springs on Highway 24. And their highlight is that they preserve thousands of fossil specimens of uh, plant life, including an old species of redwood, as well as uh, insects. It's identified as a night sky park, meaning that it gets little to no light pollution from the surrounding areas. And they have programs throughout the summer months um, highlighting that. There's 14 miles of hiking trails, none of which are more than five miles round trip. Most of them are considerably shorter. A lot of outside exhibits. In the winter, you can come there and uh, cross country ski if you like, snowshoe. You can find the wild turkey in this area. The habitat is very uh, accommodating to them. You can also find, although it'll take a little more effort, they've identified 90 culturally modified trees, likely by peoples of the Ute Nation. These can be like a healing tree or a prayer tree, and they'll mark them or bend them as a sapling, and it indicates different things to the Ute people. I thought that was rather interesting. I never noticed one, but they're out there. This is the Hornbeck Homestead, uh, founded in 1878 by Adeline Hornbeck. Uh, kind of a funny note, her, her husband uh, disappeared three years prior to her coming out here. So she ended up raising their family, the kids by herself, very active in the local community. And you can take tours of the homestead. Um, the rangers there will lead you through that. Uh, of note, hers was one of the first homes to have glass windows. If you can think of the sod house that had little to nothing in the, in the way of a window, that's quite an improvement. Uh, Rocky Mountain elk can be found in this area as well. Uh, various herds of them drift in and out as they graze. Uh, the rut causes them to gather together in large, large numbers. If you're lucky enough to see that out, outside of Rocky Mountain National Park, that's a pretty good deal. Here we're down into the uh, Browns Canyon National Monument. And this is about halfway between Buena Vista and Salida, Colorado. And it basically follows, keeps the Arkansas River on its western boundary. And this is the Arkansas River in the foreground here. And that's Mount Princeton in the background. It stands 14,204 feet. So that's one of the uh, 54 14ers in Colorado that a lot of people like to climb. 
Jake and I did that one actually. You can actually drive up to right about in here. It's a very narrow Jeep trail, uh, very limited parking though. And then you cross this face and then hike up here to the top and then retrace your route back down. So that's part of the collegiate peaks. The Arkansas River offers a lot of recreational opportunities, kayaking, whitewater rafting, fishing, or just relaxing on the shore. This is an area called a Seidel Suck, which is kind of like a washing machine effect. The, the water cascades over rocks and it drops down and it gets caught in this circular motion. And if you do like these folks and just kind of ride over the top of it, you're fine, no problems. If you get caught like these people did and your raft tips, people get expelled. You don't want to get sucked as an individual person back into that cycle because it's very hard to get back out. And it just kind of keeps swinging you around and pounding you down. Fortunately, these, this group of people, they all ended up downstream and they all got picked up by their rafters. And I imagine the guy here got a little talking to <laughs> for let, letting them uh, fall in the water like that. But a little added excitement, I guess, too. This is a prairie falcon, um, similar to the uh, peregrine falcon, a little bit larger, I think. All falcons, oddly enough, the, the males are smaller than the females. In many species, birds and mammals alike, the male tends to be larger, but with falcons, it's just the opposite. This guy or gal can do upwards of 100 miles an hour in a dive, trying to, they, they hit the bird, their prey, knock them out, out of the air, knock them unconscious, they hit the ground and then they pick them up and then find a safe place to eat it. The bird lying on the left down there is a chick. He was probably just scolded and told to stay right there where you are, don't you move, I'll be right back. Now we're down now by uh, Pagosa Springs. This is Chimney Rock National Monument. Uh, it's uh, USFS, United States Forest Service property, but the Chimney Rock Interpretive Association really does most of the work in terms of managing the site and managing the flow of people in and out. Um, it was occupied by the ancestral Puebloans, Puebloans about a thousand years ago. They have daily guided walks, but the monument's only open from May until mid-October or so. I'm guessing between, because of staffing issues, I don't think the weather is prohibitive or anything, but because it relies on volunteers so much. This is some of the structures on top of the ridge where the actual chimney rock itself is found. You can see how it looks over the land that lies below in wetlands. So likely the people that lived here farmed in those lowlands and then they came back here. This offered them security and good visibility. The structure in front of us is a kiva, typically used for religious or spiritual ceremonies or just for gathering of people within the group. Now we're down to the Yucca House in uh, southwestern Colorado, south, south of Cortez. This is very much an undeveloped monument. This is pretty much what you're going to see there, some remnants of uh, foundation walls. You can look in the distance and see a, a river valley. And again, they probably farmed that. Uh, that was a source of water for them. Why they moved, uh, nobody really knows. Typically. In these sites where people live for thousands or hundreds of years, they move when they've lost water and therefore lost their ability to grow food. But sometimes there's simply no answer as to why one group of people moved from one area and relocated in another. This was found, I noticed it on the ground there while walking around the monument. Uh, to me, it looks like a seashell. So, when you find fossilized remains, oftentimes that suggests that the climate here had been much wetter previously, maybe even an inland sea. And then as that sea dried up, 
the decayed remains of plant life, sea life, animal life is covered over and over and over, and eventually it becomes fossilized. Now we're into Canyons of the Ancients, and that's a rather large monument in the southwest corner of uh, Colorado. If you want to go to this area, um, it's very much worth visiting. It's BLM land, so a lot of camping opportunities, a lot of hiking available. But sometimes getting to some of the trailheads or some of the sites is a little convoluted. So I would suggest going to the Anasazi Heritage Center up in Dolores, Colorado first. And the staff there is just excellent. They'll help you figure out what kind of a trip you wanna do, how to get there. And they'll help you make the most of your efforts and the time that you have. That's a Sleeping Ute Mountain in the distance and that's just under 10,000 feet. So these are the San Canyon Pueblo ruins. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's in the northern part, kind of north and the eastern side of the monument. Again, very undeveloped. But that's not to say that at some point down the road, it won't be restored back to something, some semblance of what it was originally. So when you visit these places, you might be tempted to pick up oh, a piece of pottery shard or uh, maybe an arrowhead, I, I don't know, or some artifact. But one, it's illegal to remove anything from any of the monuments, they're federally protected. And two, if you take that and remove it from the context within which it was found, when archeologists and paleontologists come later to restore that monument and research it, that evidence is, is gonna be out of context again. And, and it's just going to add to the confusion. So take a picture of it, enjoy it, look at it, but don't move it and definitely don't remove it from any of these lands. We this have a is... quick question here, Mike. Oh, sure. Um, so let's see, we have a question. Did you, did you use a cell phone app to find dispersed camping on BLM land? <laughs> Or how did you, what was the best way to find it? <laughs> so the short answer is no. However, I do have a tablet and I use that after consulting with the Heritage Center in Dolores. And surprisingly, my tablet, I think it was MapQuest or something like that on there. It stayed active and kept track of the various county roads you had to negotiate to get to some of the different sites. Um, I would say, you know, like a, a lot of climbing or mountaineering adventures, you should always have a hard copy map. But in this case, getting one to cover each of these areas, and, you know, when they're in millions of acres, it would be quite expensive and just, I don't know, it'd be so cumbersome to try to, to manage that. So I relied on my tablet and the map program, the application within that. And I didn't have any real difficulties. But of course, I was equipped to stop and camp wherever I ended up at the same time. So <laughs> your experience might be a little different. Be prepared, though. <laughs> this is the southern trailhead for the uh, Sand Canyon Trail, which goes from those previous ruins six and a half miles down to this trailhead. There's a couple of ways you can hike it. My recommendation is to start from the northern trailhead by the ruins hike downhill early in the morning when it's cool, have a shuttle car down here, and it'll take you right back to the top. Some people do it all the way down and back again. Some people do it down and then wish they had a shuttle car <laughs> and try to figure out a way to get back up without hiking all the way back up in, in the heat. But uh, a worthwhile uh, hike. There's a lot of ruins, petroglyphs along the way. So very informative, very useful. Hovenweep, a very small monument that straddles Colorado-Utah border. Two of the units, the uh, Horseshoe and Hackberry groups are in Colorado, while the park headquarters, visitor center and campground are in Utah. They're really not that far apart, maybe 20 miles or so. But uh, 
I'm always impressed by the the quality of the construction of these uh, structures. It just amazes me when you think that they're simply putting one rock on top of the other, public, using the sand and mud from nearby to make a mortar in the hopes that it stays together. This one in the middle of the slide is pretty much a two-story structure. So how do you get that to stand on its own? In the center wall there, you can see where they doubled the thickness of the wall. It's, it's just amazing. I mean, I, don't, I couldn't do that today, even with all the modern tools and techniques available. So it's very impressive. And they're still standing hundreds, hundreds of years later. Now we'll scoot up to Grand Junction, Colorado. And this monument, Colorado Monument, is just west of town. Oftentimes in the winter, you'll get a heavy, wet snowfall. And then the next day, it's clear, sunny, a little bit warm. So you get this mist rising up out of the canyons. And it can make for some nice photographs. This is a chukar. It's a game species. And they introduced this in this area back in the 1930s. And they come from Europe originally, but they find the hab habitat here very suitable for them and they thrive. I don't know that anybody really hunts them out here in the monument. Uh, this is uh, Independence Tower on the left. What's remarkable about that, it has a nice climbing route on it. On the, you go around the right side, it's on the west side of the monument. So you stay in the shade except for the last pitch. And the two cruxes are the middle slide. It's a bit of an off width there. And then the slide on the right is the uh, capstone that you have to surmount. But what's really remarkable about this climb is that it was done by John Otto in 1911. No modern techniques for climbing, no modern equipment, no safety rope to speak of. You can see here by the Tom's foot, Looks like a carved out step here. And then on the capstone, there's some more steps. And that's basically what he did in cowboy boots. He carved steps all the way up this thing. And it's four pitches long and got to the top and then managed his way back down. And it just blows me away. I mean, you know, certainly it was a little eccentric. Anybody taking on something like that has to be, but it's quite an accomplishment. In every 4th of July, there's a local climbing club in the Grand Junction that makes an ascent in honor of the 4th of July, certainly, but also in honor of John Otto himself and what he accomplished here. It's quite remarkable. There's a drive. If you're a little short on time, it'll still take you a couple, three hours, but it's a 23-mile Rimrock drive that essentially follows the rim of all of these various canyons along the monument. It's just gorgeous. A number of pullouts, you can get views down into the, the canyons. Um, I would recommend that if, if nothing else. There is a campground there run by the National Park Service and it's open year round. There's no hookups or anything, so you better have your own heat in the winter. But uh, yeah, worth, worth the trouble. There are desert bighorn sheep within the monument. Probably the best bet for it would be the same uh, canyon that leads you to Independence Tower. I believe it's uh, Wedding Canyon. And along that way, you may be able to spot them. A little tip on photographing wildlife, whether it's mammals or birds, um, don't approach them. If your lens isn't long enough, be happy with what you got because I can almost guarantee you as soon as you approach them, a bird's going to fly away and mammals, they're going to walk away and all you're going to get are the classic butt shots. So you won't get what you were hoping to get in the first place. If you're in an environment where you have, you're in your vehicle, use your vehicle as a blind. Most animals that are accustomed to being seen, they're used to traffic going by, but as soon as you step out of the vehicle, that changes that whole dynamic and you become more of a threat and they're going to act accordingly. What I look for in a good uh, wildlife photo of a mammal 
is this part right here, catch light is what that's called, where the light reflects off the animal's retina. It draws the viewer right to the eye and you make that eye to eye contact. The other thing I look for are the ears. They should be forward. You see here, this guy's ears are back because he's intimidated by this sheep here, who's just looking to start trouble. So, he, and it doesn't make for a good photo. This, to me, makes for a much more appealing photograph of a wild mammal that's not stressed. This guy here, he's, he's under some stress because of, one, he's laying down, so he's vulnerable. And the other guy, what, what sheep like to do when they go to pick a fight, is they'll take their front legs and they'll kick the other sheep in the chest. <laughs> so you kind of know when they're gonna get at it and get that started. Now we're up into Dinosaur National Monument up in the Northwestern uh, corner of Colorado. This is the Green River. Rafting, boating is very popular on both the Green and Yampa rivers that run through the monument itself. Although this looks very calm and easy to float, Downstream, it turns into class four, class five rapids. So if you don't know what you're doing, there's plenty of guide services that'll get you through that safely. And there's a number of campgrounds that are reserved for boaters only along the river, them, river itself. So that's kind of an added bonus. These petroglyphs can be found on the uh, Northern Island Park Road at what's called the McKee Spring site. A lot of petroglyph sites will have these anthropomorphic figures, they'll have, like this guy in the middle here, and they'll have a lot of the abstract uh, symbols. Many of them contain uh, wildlife of some sort or another, and whether that's something they saw, something they killed for food, or just something that's endemic to the region, and who knows? Since these people are no longer with us, it's just, an educated guess as to what any of these symbols actually mean. This is great. If you go there for nothing else, go to the quarry exhibit hall. So they picture a wall of rock 150 feet long, and they built this structure over it, the exhibit hall, and they've preserved all of the fossils as they were, as they were found for people to view. It's 150 feet long, and they estimate there's more than 1,500 fossils embedded in the rock. It's, it's just a great educational opportunity for kids, even adults. I mean, it's right there in front of you. You look at that and you say, yeah, that was a dinosaur that lived here in maybe a moister, warmer climate millions of years ago. And this is evidence of their having been here. It's pretty fascinating. This is rabbit brush, of which there's about 21 different varieties. And I like it. it, it's found throughout the West, so it's very common, but I like it because of the green and yellow contrast. And I think it blooms practically year round out there, as long as the temperature is relatively moderate. So you, you have some nice color to the landscape with that. I don't know that rabbits eat it or not, but they do call it rabbit brush. This is the campground down at Echo Park. They recommend a high clearance vehicle with four wheel drive. Not so much for the drive in, although that's a little difficult, but definitely for getting back out of there. It's all an uphill drive over a rocky road. And if it's wet, it makes it consider considerably more difficult. You may end up staying there a few extra days while things dry out. <laughs> but not a bad place to hang out either at the same time. So this is uh, Steamboat Rock on the Green River within the uh, Echo Park campground. What I did here was this is a 75 minute exposure with a wide angle lens, 20 millimeter wide angle lens at F 2.8. There was a partial moon, so it provided some light in addition to the long exposure and you get your compass out, <clears throat> you find where true north is. And then I lined up the rock according to that. That bright spot here in the middle is the North Star or Polaris. And once you get all that lined up and your camera sitting on a tripod, you set it up with 
an electric release, electric cable release for whatever time you choose. I chose 75 minutes. I usually do one hour to 90 minutes for that circular effect in the night sky, but because of the moon, a partial moon, I thought, well, I'll cut it back a little bit and see how that exposes the rock in the foreground. And that's, that's one of the beauty, beauties of uh, digital cameras. You can do this. And then at the end of the 75 minutes, you take a look at what your results are and then you adjust it as needed. Or this was the first go around with this. I was pretty happy with it. So I kept it. But that 75 minutes gives you time to make dinner or just kind of set up camp while you're taking a picture at the same time. So just something to think about. This is the landscape out here in Dinosaur. Much of it is wilderness, roadless, um, open to backpacking certainly, but uh, it's not for the novice. Water sources are hard to find. Uh, the terrain is rugged. The temperatures can oftentimes be quite hot up into the pushing 100 degrees at times. Uh, you really need to know land navigation skills so you don't just blunder out into here and have an adventure. Well, you have an adventure for sure and hope somebody might find you. <laughs> a little further north near Kimmerling, Wyoming in the southwestern part of the state, Fossil Butte, very colorful buttes there. Um, this is run by the National Park Service. It's pretty restricted. They got a few trails, not a whole lot. One road that goes into the monument, goes up on top for a high viewpoint, but uh, the switchbacks are very sharp, so you don't want a long vehicle and definitely nothing with a trailer. However, the visitor center is, is very good. They have a lot of displays that you can view. They have a working um, paleontological uh, laboratory there and the staff are more than happy to interact with you. So that's, I guess, is a bit of the trade off there. They have to protect the sites, again, from uh, plundering by people that come up there and, and take stuff, take fossilized remains and try to resell them. Now we're up in uh, northeastern Wyoming. This is Devil's Tower. And again, uh, President Roosevelt declared this the first national monument in September of 1906. So there's a scientific geological explanation for how this plug of rock found itself out on what's otherwise relatively flat or rolling hills in uh, Eastern Wyoming. However, there's a Kiowa legend that I much, much prefer. In it, it describes how there's seven girls are being chased by bears. So they jump on this low rock and they start praying to the rock for help. Well, the rock raises them up in the sky. And as it's growing, the bears are clawing at the side of the rock, creating all these marks and these parallel columns. The rock keeps growing up into the sky further and further and further. And eventually the seven girls become a group of seven stars that are known as the Pleiades which are visible on winter nights over the tower. And I think for me, that's a far more interesting explanation. Forget the science, I'll take this any day. Another little oddity regarding the tower itself is uh, back in 1941, a fellow decided to parachute on the top. Now mind you, this is when parachuting was just beginning. The army was just learning about parachuting, people jumping out of planes and actually surviving. So he got to the top okay, he hit his mark, but when they dropped the rope, it missed. So he sat up there for six days while they got um, Duranchi and Petzl from up in the, over in the Tetons to come on over and rescue him from the top of the tower. So <laughs> kind of funny. So here's climbing on the tower is pretty popular around the world. People come from all over the world to climb here. The only caveat is that the month of June is a voluntary closure. And that recognizes Native American beliefs and spiritual customs that the tower is sacred, nobody should be on it. And it was a bit of a compromise that allowed 
people to use the tower itself as a recreational activity, but still trying to protect and respect the rights of the Native Americans. And I think for the most part, climbers respect that. If you hike around in the area, you may come across what are called prayer flags or other symbols of uh, Native uh, spiritual importance. Don't touch any of those, don't photograph them, don't move them, don't do anything, don't go near them. They're not ours as a Euro-Caucasian. It's not mine to interfere with. Um, I, don't, those, I don't understand them. They're somebody else's beliefs and I'm going to respect that. And I think you should. Ah, my favorite slide, because it gives me so many favorite memories of this visit in particular to the Upper Missouri River Breaks. Big monument, follows the Missouri River corridor from Fort Benton uh, eastward. But this is late August. Water levels are relatively low. The water itself is a lazy about oh, three miles an hour. Plenty of time to get between the different campsites, time to get out and hike around on public lands. It's just a beautiful, relaxing five days for me and Jake. And we, we traveled, we floated predominantly in the morning because it was cooler. It got a little warm in the 90s in the afternoon, so we found a campsite with shade. Just a wonderful float. These are the chalk cliffs. You'll find these in different parts of the monument, um, typically on public lands. There's a lot of private land here, so get a map and make sure you're not camping or hiking on private lands because they've got a, a very good working relationship with the, the landowners. Um, if you do float this, I would recommend taking uh, the book, it's called Undaunted Courage by Stephen Ambrose, and it chronicles the journey of Lewis and Clark in the early 1800s upriver along the Missouri River to the west coast of the United States. And a guide, a river guide will highlight some of the campsites, the campgrounds that the expedition occupied, both going to the west coast and on the return. Now we're gonna jump over to Washington State up in the uh, northwestern part of it. So this is north of Seattle. Where you take I-5 essentially towards the Canadian border up by Bellingham. And these are the San Juan Islands. It's an archipelago of thousands of islands, not very large in total acreage, but it does, it does cover a, a pretty large area. Uh, the key here to visiting this, given its proximity to Seattle and the millions of people there is the Washington State Ferry, which is an excellent system, but you have to plan ahead. You have to know where you wanna go and when you wanna go, and you make your reservations in advance. I would recommend uh, midweek, possibly in the off season, during the late fall through winter and then early spring. This photograph was taken from the top of Mount Constitution. Uh, big views, lots to see. This is the ferry ride from Anacortes, which is your jumping off point on the way over to Orcas Island. That's Mount Baker in the distance. That's uh, part of the North Cascades, just under 11,000 feet and a great mountaineering objective. If you wanna learn how to climb glaciated peaks and deal with crevasses and glaciers and snow. Now we're down a little further south in Washington to Mount St. Helens. Um, big event occurred here in uh, May of 1980. Previously, this peak went up to about here. It was a very pyramidal shaped peak, about 1300 feet higher than what it is now. In May of 1980, it blew up this lateral blast. They estimated the speed at 670 miles an hour. <clears throat> it devastated hundreds of miles, hundreds of square miles around the monument. You can go to the Johnson Observatory or Windy Ridge Observatory, which is over in this direction, and kind of look right into that north side crater. Get a good, a little closer view of oh, just everything that happened there. 
this river down here, the Toodle River, was blocked by mud flow and log jams. And it actually dropped the Columbia River downstream from 36 feet to 13 feet because of the blockage of water. Just amazing. So hiking the south side of Mount St. Helens is pretty uh, common, pretty popular. Uh, you'll need a permit for it. As you can see, it's a long slog up a loose, dusty, volcanic surface. My preference is to ski it. So you ascend with your boots or you do use skins or a split board, get to the top, enjoy the views. You get to see Mount Hood, Mount Adams, Rainier, Curtis Gilbert, all of the major peaks in the uh, Cascades, and then ski back down. And I found that to be far more pleasant and quicker than slogging your way up and slogging your way back down again. <clears throat> this is part of the ape cave system. Uh, these aren't caves per se, although they act like it, but they're originally a lava tube. So lava flowed through this at one point and then it was exhausted, cooled and evacuated in leaving these corridors some of them are quite long. This one in particular is about a mile long. I remember one time I went back here and walked to the end and it's just a, a block of rock. It's a wall of rock at the end. The, the key here though is always carry at least two light sources with extra batteries for each. Because this is, this is pitch black. There's absolutely nothing in there to light your way other than what you bring with you. I use my headlamp to paint the wall of the cave or the lava tube with light so it would illuminate it a little better. And again, the beauty of digital, it took me several shots to get the exposure just right, but it gives you a good idea of what that might look like. <laughs> kind of creepy. Oh, if you've traveled to another cave, don't wear the same shoes or clothing that you wore in that cave because you risk spreading what's called a white nose syndrome from one cave bat to another. And what this does is it weakens them from their hibernation cycle, causes them to be disoriented and eventually will kill the bat. And the way it's spread is primarily through people bringing it from one cave system to another. So make absolutely sure your clothes are clean, sterilized and good to go. Now we're down here in uh, the John Day Fossil Beds in Oregon. They have three units, the Sheep Rock, Clarno, and then this one, the Painted Hills unit. What you see here, this lighter colored yellow brownish soil, that represents a, a cooler and drier climate. Whereas the reddish color here, that's typically a little moisture like maybe in a rainforest sort of setting. And all these little black specks are manganese. They represent manganese. Manganese is one of nine essential elements for plant life. So you kind of get an idea of how in prehistoric terms, things begin and plants can begin to grow if they have the, the elements and the nutrients essential for their growth. It's a very colorful unit to go to. A relatively short hike to get up here to the viewpoint. Newberry Volcanic, uh, south of Bend, Oregon, uh, part of the Southern Cascades in Oregon. All of these peaks are right at or just below 10,000 feet. Lots of opportunity for mountaineering, skiing. Within the monument itself, um, particularly if you go there in the winter, as I did, um, they have a system of cross country ski trails and they have a separate system of trails specifically for snow machines. So you can pursue both those activities without interfering with the other. And they have several warming huts scattered throughout the trail system. Uh, it's just a good way to enjoy it. This is the obsidian flow. And if you know anything about obsidian, you know when you break it, it creates a near razor sharp edge. So this became, became a very valuable trading commodity for the peoples that lived in this region. 
and they would trade for foods or items that they didn't have or didn't have access to. And the obsidian, they can use that to clean animal skins, cut crops, vegetables, just all manner of things. A little further south, the Cascade Siskiyou uh, National Monument was set aside specifically for the biodiversity that it represents, something which this great gray owl desperately needs in order to survive. This guy was, he eventually got annoyed at me, but I was still quite a distance away and I had a large telephoto lens, but they have very sharp eyesight and uh, he didn't always take too kindly to me being there. But. These are Western Greaves, one of the lakes within the monument and surrounding areas. They do that mating courtship dance, kind of a competitive thing. Here, I can do this better than this other guy over here, so choose me for your partner. Then we come down to uh, Craters of the Moon up in Idaho. It's interesting, this is shot at morning at sunrise from the top of what's called the Inferno Column. It's a very short but steep hike. I think it's only two tenths of a mile up, but it is pretty stiff. But you'll get good views of a lot of what they call spatter cones, not quite a volcano, just little eruptions of uh, lava and magma. And it's also interesting to note that the landscape here resembled that of the moon, so much so that the astronauts from the Apollo 14 mission in 1969 trained here. You have to remember that they, they're pilots, they, they're not geologists. So they don't, they don't know one rock from another. So this is where they learn how to choose rock samples, how to collect them when they went to the moon and, and we returned with a payload of moon rocks. Now we're over into Bears Ears. Um, just a bit of a side note, both Bears Ears, if you don't already know, and uh, Escalante, were reduced in size by President Trump. And this represents the current size as does the, the slide for uh, Escalante. I think what's important to note is these presidential proclamations or executive orders, they've been challenged legally in the past and I couldn't find evidence of any of them holding up in court. So there's really no legal precedent for President Trump to reduce the size of a monument that had already been established by a previous president. So it'll take time certainly as they go through the litigation process, but I, I'm pretty confident in the end, um, the opposition will lose out, these monuments will be restored to their original size and life will be good. These are the monarch ruins, um, a short hike to them. You can't actually go into the ruins themselves. This is along Butler Wash, and there's several other sites that you can hike to and explore. The Wolfman Panel, Big Crane, Procession Panel, several others. This is just kind of interesting to me as a photographer. So the water went through the sandstone above where it was darker and more mineralized, and then leached down below onto the lighter sandstone and kind of made this pattern that looks like the roots of a tree or whatever you want it to look like. <laughs> now we're into Natural Bridges Monument. Uh, there's three bridges of note within the monument itself. This is Okoyama, there's Sapapu and Kachina in a nine mile counterclockwise driving loop will put you in view of all three of those bridges. This one here is 106 feet tall, pretty impressive. It's a short walk down, a little, little strenuous coming back up, but not too difficult. But it's far more impressive to stand underneath this thing and view it from below. <clears throat> so you say, maybe you don't say, but in case you were wondering, how do you distinguish an arch from a bridge? Well, an arch is formed by wind and rain erosion and the freeze thaw cycle, whereas a bridge is formed by water cutting underneath what becomes the bridge through the rock itself. And then there's some degree of uh, natural erosional processes involved as well. Arches typically occur up along a ridge line as well, whereas a bridge 
is down in and inside a drain. It's much like this one. Now we're down into Grand Staircase Escalante, another very large, large monument managed by the BLM. This is called Devil's Garden. It's about seven or eight miles down what's called Hole in the Rock Road. And great place to look at what are called hoodoos, these structures of sandstone that weather, that erode at a slower rate than the surrounding sandstone does. While there's no camping allowed within this particular site, the nearby BLM lines allow for dispersed camping. There's slot canyons to see down here, um, an area for dinosaur tracks. Um, it's very interesting. This is uh, Kodachrome Basin State Park. Um, it's within the Escalante Monument itself, but it remains a state park. The benefit of this place is it has showers and a seasonal laundry. <laughs> so you can take a couple of days off from your travels, get cleaned up. I don't believe there's any internet there. The last time I visited, there wasn't. Um, maybe they've upgraded that. But um, if you are gonna spend a day or two there, the nearby uh, Grosvenor's Arch, which is a 100 foot sandstone arch, is a nice day trip that's pretty close by, I think within about 30 minutes. Information for Escalante Monument itself is best found at the Interagency Visitor Center in the small town of Escalante. You can also stock up on things there that you can gas and they have a nice grocery store. Now we're on to Gold Butte in Nevada. This is a view at sunset of Lake Mead on the drive-in. This is another one of those monuments that you can drive and drive and drive and drive. The road goes from bad to worse to just sometimes absolutely horrible. Or you're driving on a wash bed with lots of loose gravel. Interesting experience, but be prepared because you're a long way from anybody helping you out. This is what's commonly referred to as a newspaper rock. People traveling through, they, they'll express themselves artistically making little etchings along the rock and say, well, here's a, here's a mammal. This looks like a, a, a bighorn sheep, a desert bighorn. This here might be a lizard. Maybe the size of your foot was important back then. I don't know, but a lot of them have footprints in them. <laughs> um, some abstract designs. You can sit there and look at these. There's another one up by uh, Indian Creek, the climbing area and over by Bluff, Utah, on the southern end of Butler Wash, there's one in the campground right there along the San Juan River. And they're just fascinating because it's, it's just a form of expression, artistic expression and or communication. Basin and Range, this is another huge place, easy to get lost in. There's roads that crisscross throughout the monument. So you, you want to try to pick up a, a map if you can, because that can be very useful. Get a good, before you lose an internet connection, get a good sense of which way these roads go. If you can't find a map, write it out, draw it out on a piece of paper. It's big. A lot of the mountain ranges here are quite narrow. So you get these big, huge valleys in between them. Mostly sand, dusty sand. Uh, gets wet, very difficult to drive. One thing of note here is uh, an, what's called an earth art project started by Michael Heiser back in 1972. It measures about a quarter of a mile across by 1.25 miles in length. And it's an amazing structure. You can see it from a distance of a couple of miles away. And because it's partly underground, you, you can't make it out, but you can go online and get some photos, images from people that were allowed to go in there and photograph it. And it's, it was made, begun before this was declared a monument. So it remains private land within the monument, an inholding, if you will. And it's not open to the public yet. Uh, it was still closed as we went to press, but, um, they don't welcome trespassers, so don't go down there thinking, oh, 
I'll just be real friendly and he'll invite me in. <laughs> Maybe not, but it's pretty impressive. I would say go online and look at some of the images there. Pretty impressive. The endangered desert tortoise can be found out here. Um, a highly endangered species, a very low reproductive rate. Um, they're long lived, certainly. If you run across one, don't do anything to disturb it. I guess the only uh, exception to that would be if they were on a roadway that was frequently traveled by cars and they were at risk of getting hit. I, would, I wouldn't feel bad picking him up, keeping him pointed in the same direction of his travel and getting him off the road or her off the roadway because it could take them a couple of hours to get across the, the highway. This is a great photo by my friend, uh, Gary Harshbarger. Very sharp image, good eye contact, excellent. California coastal. So this follows the entire California Western coast from top to bottom, roughly uh, 1,100 miles more or less extends out into the sea for about 13 miles or so. Very few access points. This is one of them. This is the Point Arena Lighthouse, uh, day use only. They have tours going on at the lighthouse, although some of the structure of the house itself is in question, so they may close that at any time. Uh, another neat thing along this um, particular monument is the Elephant seal pullout up by San Simeon, which gives you very, very close up views of elephant seals, males, females, the cubs. Uh, further south, you can run into, I think it's Patrick State Park. And Patrick's Point there is a, a popular place for people surfing. In the northern part of the coast, the, the uh, Coastal Redwood National Park exists and uh, a state park for the coastal redwoods as well. So a lot to see, a lot to do, a very long, long monument. It's the whole coast. This is a sea stack, a 15 second exposure at F32. And sea stacks used to be where the coastline was back sometime in history. The water waves erode it. The sea stack happens to be harder rock that doesn't erode so easily. So it remains further and further out from the, the present uh, shoreline. The long exposure kind of gives it all, the waves themselves sort of a misty look appearance to it. Now we're down in the Berryessa Snow Mountain. Now this is Berryessa Lake, but it's actually not part of the monument. This is a very contentious monument to establish and one of the compromises was that the lake would remain open for recreational uses, boating, fishing, et cetera. But the surrounding lands managed by the BLM and Forest Service would be open to the general public. A lot of private land here. So be very careful as you make your way around the monument, make sure you're on public lands. If you're not sure, you know, stop at a ranch or a house and say, hey, is this private or public? Can I go this way or not? It just makes for a better relationship between the public and, and these private landowners. You can find truly elk here. They're a slightly smaller subspecies of elk um, found in the, in the West, not in very many places. This goes down to Carrizo Plain, a little further south in California. This is uh, Wallace Creek. At one time, this creek bed went this way this offset wasn't here and it continued to go to the west. Over time, the St. Andreas Fault, which is just to our right, took the plate underground here and pushes it southward towards San Francisco at about 35 millimeters a year. That's about as much as your, your nail bed grows. So this is a 425 foot offset of, Wallace, of the Wallace Creek bed. And it's just perfect evidence of how those tectonic plates shift past one another. They'll build up pressure. Maybe they release a little bit at a time. Maybe it builds up pressure for a significant event like an earthquake. You have a, it's a much more dramatic experience. 
Sometimes at the Soda Lake here, you can find uh, sandhill cranes as they migrate through the area. Down to giant sequoia. These are huge trees, by the way. Jake's a pretty big dog. He goes about 100 pounds or so, but he's dwarfed by this tree. It's just amazing. They can weigh up to 2.7 million pounds. The bark can be as thick as three feet thick. And that protects them from fire and insects. Although fire isn't exactly always their enemy. When they drop a cone, a pine cone to the floor of the forest, fire is necessary for that cone to open up and release the seeds. And then the ash that's left over from the fire provides nutrients for that seed to grow. So it's kind of a, a symbiotic relationship between the fire and these giant sequoias themselves. People will make the argument, well, we ought to get in there and cut all these things down. It's safer and whatnot. But <clears throat> the, the reality of it is the usable lumber that might be gained from one of these trees, while there's a lot of board feet, oftentimes when they fall, they'll shatter. So you don't end up with a lot of usable lumber at any rate. So I think it's a dead argument. Now we're into Devil's Pulse Pile. And like uh, Sarah mentioned, this was the one monument I wasn't able to get into because of the avalanche danger and I was skiing in by myself. But uh, I got some photos from livestock that dem demonstrate what's there pretty accurately. These basalt columns, pretty unique. They were pushed up from underground. The only way you can camp in the small campground there within the monument is if you have a reservation or if you're driving, or I'm sorry, if you're back backpacking in the backcountry, the Ansel Adams wilderness. Otherwise, every, everybody has to catch the shuttle at Mammoth Ski Area to come in, visit the monument, walk around. It's not terribly large. And then catch the shuttle back to your vehicle at Mammoth. And by the way, if you ski, Mammoth gets like 20 feet of snow a year, just FYI. This is a nearby Mono Lake, a kind of a side attraction. Very interesting, these limestone uh, rocks. They look like they're being pushed out of the water, but what actually happened is the water level was at one time above the rocks. And then the water sources that feed the lake were diverted to Los Angeles and the water level's been dropping and dropping and dropping since the 1930s. It's down about 40 feet right now. And they're working to change that to fill the, the lake back up again. And what's really important here though is as the water level drops, the salinity of the lake itself increases and there's brine shrimp within the lake. And those shrimp are critical for the thousands of migratory birds that stop here every spring and fall. So if the brine shrimp go away, then these migratory birds go away as well. So it's pretty important to restore this, not to just a reasonable level of salinity, but perhaps to what it was before they started draining or diverting the water. So now we're down in Mojave Trails, uh, big, big monument, 1.6 million acres. This just sort of shows you we're going back to Cadiz Dunes in the northern part of the monument. All the sand can go from okay to bad to worse to the point where maybe I'm needing to turn around because I'm by myself and digging out of this mess would be very, very difficult. So I was already in four low at this point when I decided to turn around. My last next option was to air down my tires and go further, but the trailhead's just right up here. And there was no real benefit to going any further and wasting time digging myself out if that proved to be the case. So I just backed up a little bit, found a spot with firm sand, <coughs> camped for the night, got up early, hiked that short distance to the dunes and photographed the dunes at sunrise. Now getting to these dunes is a little difficult. It's about 35 miles on a bad road from the south or 15 miles from the north, but the north, 
the bridge there is closed in the small community of Cadiz. So most likely you'll have to drive in from the south, but check with the state troopers before you go in there. They may have fixed the bridge and you're good to go. Uh, slightly better road, but definitely a shorter distance. Here we are in Oregon Pipe Cactus Monument. These here are the organ pipes. This is a saguaro. This is a, what do they call it? Uh, Koya, Oko, no, Koya, Koya cactus, teddy bear cactus, because it looks soft and cuddly, but it's anything but. Um, this has been designated a UNESCO International Biosphere Reserve because of the diversity of plant and animal species here in the different zone, eco zones. It's also home to the endangered pupfish. A little thing about an oh, inch and a half long or so, kind of a purplish blue color. Um, and the rare Sonoran antelope, which is a cousin, a, a smaller cousin to the pronghorn antelope that we're accustomed to here in uh, Colorado. If you want to go there for the saguaro cactus bloom, that typically happens in May and can vary from year to year depending on, on water. This is a pyroluxia, a desert cardinal. Beautiful bird found throughout the desert. Very powerful bill for cracking seeds. Now we're down into southeastern Arizona. This is a Chiricahua. National Monument. These are called the Standing Up Rocks by the Chiricahua Apache. Over in this area here is the Turkey Creek Caldera. It was a volcano that erupted some 27 million years ago and was estimated to be a thousand times more powerful than St. Helens. <clears throat> so just massive, massive devastation here. This is a view from the Maasai Point, which you can drive to. This is a uh, white-nosed Cotamunde, member of the raccoon family. You got a flexible nose to sniff around, get into tree hollows. Long tail for balance, for jumping around. Um, they can be very aggressive, very inquisitive as well. So it's pretty important if you're camping at the campground there to secure your food, anything that has an odor, in a hard-sided container or vehicle. This area has also been identified as an important bird area for what, uh, what they call sky islands, little mountains that offer different levels of uh, eco zones that birds favor as they migrate or even those that become residents here, they offer different habitat for a variety of bird species. This is the sunrise from Maasai Point looking eastward across the San Simeon Valley. Some of these areas here would be called a sky island, a very distinct ecosystem that supports a variety of uh, life. Here we are in Agua Fria, um, just a little further north, right off the interstate, very accessible. Again, very undeveloped. There's not much here. The roadways are, uh, they're okay but they get wet and they become impassable. The Perry Mesa and Black Mesa peoples lived here in these very, very rudimentary uh, ruins. They made a lot of petroglyphs and you can find those down in the uh, Badger Springs Wash, which is just down the inter interstate from the, uh, from the entrance to the monument itself. Nice place, good place. If you find water here, you're gonna find a lot of birds and other wildlife. So a good place to hang out for a few days and just see who comes by. If you're lucky enough to find an agave plant like this here that's in bloom, so they're about 15, 20 feet tall, you get this bright pinkish red, yellow blossom bloom, big circular bloom on top, attracts all sorts of birds and insects, uh, much like this uh, black chin hummingbird. A little further north and uh, above Prescott, uh, what's called the Tuzigat ruins. This is one of my favorite sites just because it looks so symmetrical. Looks like they put a lot of thought into how they were building things. Um, 
not only because they placed it high on a hill above the wetlands below, which were likely infested with mosquitoes, but it was very strategic. It gave them a view all around, a 360 degree view. They likely farmed in the lowlands where the water was located. And hard to say why they left because the Verde River, which is nearby, is still there. So that water source didn't disappear. It could have been for cultural reasons, uh, or maybe they were driven off by another people, so it's hard to say. This is a Western tanager. In the springtime in particular, you can find dozens, if not hundreds of species that are both residents and uh, passing migrants along the Verde River riparian zone. This is just north of uh, Flagstaff, the Wapaki, National Monument. Surprisingly, this is actually three stories high and it's called the Tall House. The ancestral Puebloans lived here, passed through this area for over 10,000 years. There was a spring located nearby, a sinkhole that likely held water. They were able to do some farming. Um, again, these sources probably dried up and forced the people to move on unfortunately, but the architecture again, just always amazes me it's what they had to work with and how well they did and how well it blended into the surrounding terrain. Canyon de Chez up by Chinle, Arizona, up in the Northeastern part of uh, the state. So ancestral Puebloans have inhabited this area along with the Hopi and Navajo nations for some 5,000 years. So you have differential erosion occurring here, creating this deep, very deep canyon. There's a rim drive that allows you to look down into the canyon at um, a number of different ruins. You can hike, the only ruins you can hike to by yourself are the uh, White House ruins. The others require a, a Navajo guide, which is a different, another different way to experience the, the monument itself. This is called Spider Rock, and it's named for Spider Woman, who's a Navajo goddess in their cultural history that taught the women how to weave. So this site is sacred, it's off limits. You know, none of us have any business going in there, but you can easily see it and appreciate it um, from the side of the road one of, at one of the pullouts. So. Rainbow Bridge, not a big monument, 160 acres. Pretty massive bridge though, it's 290 feet high and about 275 feet across. It's a sacred site, you can't walk underneath it, nobody. And the trail that leads from the boat dock to the, the bridge itself stops right about in here to keep people from walking underneath it. Two ways you can approach this. The way I did it was a boat, boat ride, about five hours round trip out of Page, uh, Arizona. The other way is a 17 mile cross country effort that requires permission from the Navajo Nation. And I would say exceptionally good navigational skills to, just to get there. You're going in and out of canyons, up and down. Water is hard to find. Um, there's no cell signal out there, so GPS doesn't work. There may be cairns marking the trail, there may, may not be, they may have been washed away. Um, I think for most of us, hop on the boat, enjoy the drive, the, the boat ride across Lake Powell and enjoy your time at the monument. All right, now we're down into the wave itself in the Vermilion Cliffs Monument that straddles Utah, Arizona. This is a very, very small site in the Coyote Buttes. And fortunately, it's managed, access is managed by a lottery system for permits to, to go into the area. And I don't think they have but 20 or 30 a day. You can do it online. I would say do it well in advance. They have a walk-in lottery at, in Kanab at the office there for the next day, but there's even fewer tickets available for that. Um, very difficult to get, worthwhile, make the most of your, your good fortune. It's about a three mile one-way hike. 
starts out on the other side of this little ridge here and kind of goes cross country. They try to mark the route, give you pictures, what the landmarks should look like as you're walking there, but uh, without actually making a, a boardwalk for you to go from one point to the other. Other alternative activities, uh, the Pariah River Canyon, there's a 38 mile backpack trip down the length of that canyon. Again, this isn't for the novice, only for the very experienced. And I would highly recommend checking the weather forecast you, before you get caught down in some of these narrow slot canyons there. The uh, California condor has been released in this area as well. And at the south entrance to the monument, um, there's a, a release site and they do that intermittently throughout the year. There's a Navajo bridge on the southeast part of the monument right off the highway as you're going back to Page, Arizona. And sometimes you can see the, the uh, condors flying above the Colorado River before it enters the Grand Canyon. And sometimes they'll be perched on some of the bridge structure there. But it's worth a stop and taking a look. Grand Canyon Parachant, another just absolutely huge monument, over a million acres. Good views of the Western Grand Canyon. Where we're camped here is about 50 miles into the monument. And I stopped because the road went from bad to worse. And it finally got to the point where I was concerned because of all these sharp pointed volcanic rocks sticking up out of the, uh, the roadway. I was sure I was gonna puncture a tire. So I stopped here, which is about seven miles from the western end of the Grand Canyon down in this area. There's a ranch a few miles back, uh, I think it's called the Bar 10 Ranch, and they're kind of a dude ranch. They do uh, rafting trips down the Colorado River in, in the canyon itself. Uh, they have an airstrip if you want to fly there. It's pretty, pretty nice, a nice place to hang out for a few, few days. And I was talking with the ranch manager. And they, they have ATVs. They run down this, this roadway. And he says virtually every time somebody takes one down, they get a flat tire. And so I'm, I was pretty happy I stayed where I was. Um, if you're in a bind, they will sell you gas. When I bought a few gallons just to see how it all worked out, no problems. The ranch manager was very friendly, very helpful. And it was about five bucks a gallon which I mean, it was about twice of what the going rate was at the time. But when you consider they have to haul it in about 50 miles over some pretty bad roads, I thought, well, that's a pretty fair deal. And, you know, if you're really short on gas, I was just seeing how the process worked. But if you're really, truly short, that can be a lifesaver because it's a long, long way out of there. The National Park manages a small portion of this uh, monument. And so they have slightly different rules. You gotta be, you can't come in until after sunrise into their unit and you gotta be gone before sunset unless you have uh, campground reservations at Two Weep Overlook Campground. It only has 10 sites and you get permits from St. George, Utah at the interagency center there or from Pipe Spring National Monument a little further to the west in uh, Northern Arizona. But this is one of the views you get to appreciate from a, a short walk down from the campground itself. And again, I was there in the winter, perfect weather, very cool, comfortable. Nobody else was there, very quiet. I actually saw a wild condor looking down onto the river, which was eh, quite a sight to see. This is just to show you that the National Park Service does have a sense of humor. I had a, they have uh, composting toilets out there and I had to chuckle when I read this on the door. <laughs> they can laugh, which is a good thing, I think. So here's some contact info. You can get a screenshot of it or just shoot me an email at the address down below if you have any questions that we don't address here at the end of the show. And uh, well, I want to thank all of you for attending. I appreciate your participation. And live a great story. Enjoy it. 
These are our lands, everybody's lands. They're, for, they're there for the public to enjoy. Thank you and take care. Thank you, Mike. That was wonderful. So many fascinating places. I would honestly love to visit all of them. And we did get a question um, um, from someone who asked, how long did it take you to do this project, um, to visit all the monuments and take the photos? <laughs> well, that's, I can hardly give a straight answer because it wasn't a, a linear process at all. It kind of went this way and that way and then over here and back and you get distracted with things. And the short answer is probably close to five years. And I visited most of these monuments two or three times, racked up about 60,000 miles on the truck. And one thing I forgot to mention at the start is that you can buy an interagency pass for 80 bucks, good for a year. And it gets you into all the national parks, any federal land that charges a fee. So just wanted to ring a bell on that one. If you're looking to visit the national parks or some of these federal lands that charge a fee, get one of those. It's, it's the best bargain out there, 80 bucks. You can, I mean, you can't, you, you can't hardly get into one park for that kind of money. So, so yeah, it was a lengthy process. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a fun one. Oh yeah. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, please um, put them in the chat and uh, I'm going to do the drawing now for the free CMC gift membership. Thanks to everyone who bought the book during uh, Mike's talk. And our winner is, and I may mispronounce your name, Amparo Maya. I'm going to put that in the chat for everyone too. And I will uh, mail the gift, uh, gift certificate to you tomorrow. Congratulations. <laughs> And enjoy. Absolutely. Well, Sarah, it's back to you. Um, well, um, does anyone have any last questions for Mike? Um, I guess I have one, one question. I'd love to hear just a little bit more about the five years that you spent visiting the National Monuments. And uh, did anything fun or unusual happen while you were out there? Any favorite memories? It just sounds like such an incredibly fun project. I think one of the most remarkable things was just realizing just how much land, particularly out west. As part of this project, I traveled to the east because it was going to include all of the monuments in the whole lower contiguous 48. And there's a number of monuments back east, but the difference, you know, once you cross the Mississippi River, maybe the Missouri River and head west, the amount of land that's available for people to recreate on is, is just astounding. Back east, it seems like it's so congested. There are people everywhere, the, the monuments themselves, the more popular ones become increasingly crowded. Um, I, I don't know, I, I think we just live in a great place out here. <laughs> Tremendous opportunities. And I'm so happy and thankful that all of this is public lands and, and very, very accessible to most people. But yeah, I, would, I would go back to kind of more directly answer your question. And the float trip on the upper Missouri River with Jake was the best. <laughs> I, I would recommend that, that one for everyone. Go out there, that looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, go out there and do it. And I, I have minimal skills, boating skills. I can swim, Jake, he can't. So we'd have to figure that out if we capsize, but it was just such an easy float, so lazy. Just, just pure joy. Well, there's just uh, so many fascinating places to visit and it was great to see your photos. Um, thank you so much, and Mike. And uh, that was 46 of the national monuments in your book, right? Out of 70? So there's, there's a lot more in this book. Um, and please check it out. Thanks to everybody who bought it. And thanks, Mike, for writing the book and um, for doing this presentation. That was really fun to get a tour of some of the national monuments in the West. Thank you, Sarah, as well, for all of your help and 
getting this to fruition in an actual hard copy book. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thanks everyone for attending and um, we'll see you at the next CMC event. Um, keep your eyes on the calendar. We have uh, some great other presentations always, always happening on the calendar. And um, thank you, Mike. Have a good evening, everyone. All right, sir. Take care. Bye.